Thank you, Andy. And uh, if you want to draw, as we normally, normally invite people to draw if you want to, uh, while the sermon is happening. So there's some images you might want to... Um, yeah. Some images you might want to uh, try out. Um, well, the, you've heard the two passages, you've heard this passage being read, these two parables. Uh, so you've got the parable of the bag of gold, bags of gold, and then the parable of the sheep and the goats. And there's lots of imagery in that if you want to draw that quite straightforward. These three different servants, what they do with the bags of gold. Some get five, one gets five, one gets two. And they double what they've got. And then this other one, he just gets this bag of gold, buries it, and produces just that one bag of gold again at the end. With the sheep and the goats, uh, the uh, Jesus at the center, he's got these sheep and goats dividing them. and he's, But he's a, a shepherd, obviously, but not just a shepherd. He's a king, and he's the Lord, and he's the son of man, the son of the father, how can he be all these things? Uh, perhaps you could draw these different aspects of Jesus as he does that. Draw these sheep and goats and what the sheep have been doing, what the goats have been doing or failing to do. Uh, or you could do one that has been tried previous weeks, suggested previous weeks, where you would think about people in church and draw them, draw their faces on coins and see how they are like the, this treasure in heaven. There, there's treasure in heaven. Well, those are some ideas. You might have even better ones, probably will. But you could go on with those, and then we'll see uh, what you come up with. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, we're at the end of this series. We are actually at the end this time. We spent eight weeks in Matthew's Gospel, looking at some of Jesus' teaching on money. And all the way through, we've been keeping this heavenly perspective uh, of making investments in that heavenly empire, storing up treasure that will last, treasure that is valuable in heaven and in the eyes of the divine emperor of heaven. And a few, at the very first week, we said, let's get our perspective on this. If you're giving away your money, what are you doing it for? Are you doing it just so people will admire you? Or is your audience that heavenly audience? And with that heavenly perspective, we continued through the weeks. And in the middle of it, we had that sermon about fix it, your attention again on Jesus. Fix it on Jesus and get him in your sights. And then what do you do when he captures your vision? What do you value? You value what he values. And... The treasure that matters is not our bank balances. The thing that we should be worrying about is not economic systems of this passing age. And we thought about that with the fish story. They don't matter in the end. They won't last for eternity. But there is wealth that we can get that lasts forever. And it's the bedrock that underlies all these stories we've looked at. And it came to a head last week where Jesus took a coin. Someone said, uh, Jesus, uh, do we have to pay our taxes? And he said, here, give me a coin. I've got one here. And he said, uh, what's on that coin? Whose face is on that coin? And they say, Caesar's face. And he goes, exactly. Give that back to him. Just give it back to him because his face is on it. He's issuing these coins. Give them back to him if he wants them. I don't issue coins. So then we need to know what is his treasure? What does he issue? What's the currency of the divine emperor? What bears his image? What coins have his face on them? People. People do. Because we look like him. The coins that he issues are people in the image of God that's the currency he's bothered about. And what a radical vision. And then because of that, the rich young man was told to give this money to that money. Give it away to that currency. Turn this money into that money. Then you've got treasure. Give it away to people. And Jesus even says straight after that, when he tells the rich young man, 
give your everything away to uh, people. He says, anyone who's given this up to follow him gets people. Brothers, sisters, parents, children, if you give up this, you'll get church family. That's the treasure you can get. People gathered into church, the treasure of the divine empire. This stuff doesn't really have any ultimate value, but you can trade it in for this heavenly treasure. You give that to get more of this. Give one currency to get the other currency. That's what Matthew did, who wrote this gospel we've been looking at. We've seen that in previous weeks. He's been mentioned, he crops up a few times. He gave up his tax collecting job to get trained by Jesus. And he gained a little church family around him that looked worthless to some people because they're just a bunch of ragtag people, but they got to eat with the divine emperor. They were valuable. That's the heavenly treasure. And when Peter, James and John and Andrew follow Jesus, what does he say he will entrust them with? He says, I will make you fishers of people. People, I will make you gather people in like fish into the kingdom. The currency of the living God, people, are his coinage. And that's what we see here. At the end of this last big block of teaching from Jesus, In Matthew's Gospel, you've got these two parables, one after the other. One does run into the other, actually. The bags of gold and the sheep and goats. This is the last bit of public teaching from Jesus before he's arrested and killed. So it's interesting that in these parables, as he knows he's about to be arrested and killed, what's on his mind? Invest in people. Because that's what he's doing. He's giving up everything for people. That's what's ahead of him. And he's dialing up this idea of investing in people for Jesus. And he's already told a parable at the end of the previous chapter, Matthew 24, about a master going away. So it's quite similar, a master going away and entrusting his servants with looking after people, caring for them. And so here in Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30, we've got a similar parable, a man, a master, going on a journey and entrusting his wealth to his servants. And it seems to make best sense if the wealth, again, is people. So he gives the first person five bags of gold, two bags of gold to the second and one to the third. And it says, note, it says, each according to their ability. That's important. Verse 15. And so it's like to the first two saying, yeah, I can entrust you. I think you've got a lot of ability in this area. I'm going to give you uh, five people, five bags of gold, two people, two bags of gold. To this last one, he says, now you can only really manage one person. So if I entrust you with one person, can you manage that? To the others, he's like, no, I'll give you five. You can deal with people well. You can deal with people well. And I know that you'll do well if I give you five, if I give you two. And then when the master returns, that first guy that he's given five people to, he now has five more people. So he's, whatever he's done, he's discipled, he's evangelized, he's, they, the others have probably evangelized as well and, Now he's ended up, whatever he's done, he's ended up with 10 people in church that he's looking after, looking out for, mentoring. He's responsible for them. And the master's like, he's like, he returns, he's like, hey, what have you got? And then he says, I've got these 10. And the master's like, brilliant, brilliant. I just gave you five and now you've got 10. That's amazing. And what I really wanted you to do was get really, get people motivated Get them built up, encourage them, organize things for them to get on with, get the best out of them. You've been really good and you've been really good with all that. And that's wonderful. How, how would you like to get the best out of even more people? Let's take it up a level. And so he says, I'm going to give you even more responsibility. And note, he sa- he's saying this when he returns as well. So this is like a at the end of the world 
This is when he returns at the end of the world. Because we think, oh, at the end of the world, there's no more responsibility left at the end of the world. Sure, all of history's happened. But it's just interesting, just as a side note, that often we think that it, we don't bother thinking about what comes after Jesus returns because that's the end of the world. It's all a mystery, isn't it? So we don't really think about it too much. It's going to be too different from what we're used to. But Jesus, there's none of that with Jesus. He's like, no, when I return, that's really when history begins. That's when all of the first chapter of history is going to start then. This is really just the preface that we're in now. And this little that I've given you now, just to get on with and take responsibility for, it's going to be so much more opportunity to get involved with uh, people, building them up, encouraging them, discipling them getting the best out of them. That's all ahead. How wonderful that is. The story's not even started yet. And this parable helps us to see reality properly. That's when world history will properly begin. Now we're going to start something really good. So actually when Jesus tells this story in Luke, the faithful servants are given responsibility for, when Jesus returns, they're given responsibility for, Responsibility for entire cities of people. So Jesus is like, here's even more people to look after, go on adventures with, do get great projects with, make memories with, all this. Come and share in your master's happiness and this, in this wonderful people-oriented new creation. That's what's ahead. So he's like that to the first guy. Then the second guy, he's almost up to what the other guy had at the beginning. So the other guy started with five. This second guy, he was given two, but now he's got four. And he's done well. He started with two treasured people. And now he's got four. He's developed them, dealt well with them. Again, he's doubled his master's wealth. And the master's like, fantastic. You've been good and faithful too. You were okay with people before, perhaps not as good as this first person. That's all right. It doesn't matter. I've given you what is, will fit your ability and you've done well with it. And you're a lot better off now than when you first started. When I first started with you, you were okay, but now you've done really well. You've been given responsibility for a few people. Now have loads more. And he's also going to have tremendous opportunities ahead of him. And the master's again saying, come and share in my happiness. The master is this happy person who has happiness to share. And it's not even so much come and share in my like, wealth or inheritance. So just share in my happiness. All these people share in that. It's not sharing dosh or anything. It's share the happiness in this people-oriented new creation. And... These people have become more people-oriented than they were. So that idea of sharing in the master's happiness is even better because they've become even more invested in people as they've gone on. And then to have loads more, it's like, wow, what a dream. What a dream. And then we get to this third boy -o, And the, the guy, he's, he's not really, he's not a people person, really. And the Lord, but the Lord has taken a punt on him. So the master said, Okay, I'll give you some opportunity to get better at dealing with people because you should be better than you are, actually. He said, look, I know you've actually got zero interest in people. But no, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you one friend, one friend in church. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a child. But someone for you to take an interest in, look after, get the best start of, help them to flourish. Grow up into this life of the kingdom of heaven. I know you're not good at dealing with people at all, but you should be better. So here you are. See what you can do. Get out there. Don't just hide away in your bunker. Get out there. Deal with these people. Invest in them. The master is actually very kind and patient because this guy really, it turns out, he does have no ability at all with people. But the master's entrusted him with someone precious to help jolt this third servant into life. What an honour to be entrusted with this treasure. And yet, when the day comes where the master wants to see what this third person's done with the precious person he's been given, the guy just goes, look, 
you're, you're quite a harsh taskmaster, really. And he's like, if, if you, so he's like, you're quite a harsh taskmaster. But when he says that, we're thinking, but he isn't really. Given all that we've seen already, he's quite a happy person. He's quite generous. Uh, and he's got this happiness to share. So what's this guy complaining about? The master has actually allowed him to get involved when he knew it would be money down the drain for him. And where the others have had this attitude of, see, this is exciting. I have gained more people. This third servant just says, look, here's your thing back. Here's what you gave me, here's it back. It's almost like he just resents the master for bothering him in the first place. He's got a totally wrong view of the master, that he's harsh. He's not really interested in what the master's interested in. In fact, he thinks the master is taking what doesn't belong to him. So he says, you harvest where you haven't sown, you gather other people's seeds that they scattered. But where's he got that idea from? There's none of that in the story. Well, there's no notion that the master has gathered where he hasn't sown. He's the opposite of that. He's not taking money off people he hasn't invested in. He's, he's invested and now he's getting a return on, what, on his investments. And he's very prepared to give money away, give away his wealth in the hope that it will get a return. The notion that he would take someone else's stuff, there's not even the slightest hint of that in the story. It's almost like this third servant has listened to lies about the master. Like when the devil said to Eve in the garden, he's just trying to spoil everything for you. He's selfish. He doesn't want you to have anything good, really. So it's down to you. You're going to fend for yourself. Get what you can. Don't take an interest in what he's doing. He doesn't want you to have anything good. He doesn't want you to share in his life, really. He's denying you what you deserve. He's taking what doesn't belong to him, so don't do what he says. That's at the heart of people who don't like Jesus. He said, I don't want anything to do with him because he wants to take my life away from me and ruin it and spoil everything. He's selfish. He wants to take from me, not give to me. And that's what this guy's like, this third guy. So when the master in verse 26 says... He says, oh, okay, so you knew that about me, did you? You knew that I'm harsh and I that just take what doesn't belong to me. Okay, well, if you did think that, and it's not true, but if you did think that, wouldn't you at least have got something for me? If I'm about taking, why didn't you do something where I get a bit extra? But you didn't. You could have um, just put the money in the bank and got some interest on it. But instead, you just dumped it in a hole in the ground and did nothing. And in people terms, it's probably like the Lord is saying, well, basically, you just buried this person I gave you. You smothered them, virtually killed them. You made it so that they weren't able to develop in any way. You just shut them down. And, but if you, even, if you thought I was like that, selfish, just wanting to take, wouldn't you at least have let that person have some limited chance for growth? Some, some, put them in some kind of situation where they could flourish and develop. And I could have got a little bit of growth at least. But instead, you just didn't want anything to do with them. You avoided them. You buried them. You buried yourself probably in your mum's basement. and just <laughs> Or just sat drinking wine, watching Netflix. Spent months on the golf course or whatever it was. You got locked in on yourself, shut down. If this person was your spouse, you shut them down at every opportunity, denying them any opportunity to grow. And the Lord is actually really annoyed about that. He's like, you're a person in church, and, but you don't want anything to do with anybody. I've given you a chance to get out there to... Uh, invest in people but you just stayed by yourself, get yourself to yourself haven't bothered investing in the one person I've guided in your direction and because
because of that, I'm going to take from you that one person that I entrusted you with, and I'm going to give them to the person that's good with people. That's what he does. He's like, give uh, this person to the person who's good with people. I'm going to set them free from you and attach them to someone in the new creation so that, that, that you now get to spend time in eternity with someone who's really good at developing your potential and bringing you out of yourself. So there's that implication that Jesus knows the circumstances of this little bag of gold, this precious bag of gold. He's like, I know your circumstances. But he's like, don't worry, I know all about it. Here, I get involved in this. Go with that person. They'll develop you. And they'll really bring out your potential. All that wasted opportunity, then it's okay. I've got it sorted. And meanwhile, so he says to the he said to the the good servants, "You've done well." Meanwhile, to this uh, third servant, he says, in verse twenty nine, he says, "There's no future for you." It's actually really harsh. If we think the bags of gold are something other than people, but if the gold is people, then we can see the master's train of thought because he's like, "We are all supposed to be into people." investing in people for Jesus and church. So if you're into that, then look, you're going to get even more. And that's brilliant. Whereas if you're turned in on yourself and you're not into people, even the tiny little relationships that you somehow managed to get yourself into accidentally, they're gone. You're not going to get to keep them. I'm actually going to put you in isolation permanently because it's not fair on the people who are connected to you they need to be set free from you because you're actually poisonous for people. And it's best if you're removed completely outside in the darkness where there are no relationships. And in the story, that's a good thing because we, we don't want anyone else dragged down with this person who's just not interested in anyone but himself. And even when that person's outside, they're going to be angry with those inside, weeping and wailing, feeling sorry for themselves, just turned in on themselves even more, re resenting the people who are inside, having a good time. And that's the end of the parable just exposes what this third guy has always been like, deep down. He hasn't grasped that in church, people are what matters. This person doesn't get that. He has a harsh view of the living God. So he doesn't really invest in people. He's more obsessed with himself, his own life, his own salvation maybe. Not actually concerned about other people at all. And then when Jesus returns on that day, it turns out that he actually meant what he said when he, want, when he told us to invest in people. Invest in people, get involved with people. Bring more people in. Gather people in. Build them up. Whereas this guy didn't want to. So he has no share in the happiness of the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus' kingdom and new creation are all about this great assembly of people. Sharing life in the divine family. So what does it mean to invest properly for Jesus? Well the next parable that this one runs into shows those investments happening. So... It, it's no longer thinking in terms just of bags of gold, but it actually shows it happening in terms of people. So Matthew's like, if you want to know what that looks like, investing for Jesus properly, then just read, just read that, the sheep and the goats. That's that happening. This, and this is the last thing that Jesus leaves us with in this big block of teaching. The sheep and the goats story is zooming in on that day when the master returns. In the parable of the bags of gold that we saw, the master returns. Well, the sheep and the goat story is zooming in on that day. Here's that day when the Lord Jesus returns. It's inviting us to get up close to what will happen on that day. From a distance, it might look like a large gathering of one kind of farm animal. But no, they, though they look similar from a distance, up close we can distinguish. Some are sheep, some are goats. And what marks out the sheep from the goats? What did they do with people? 
How did you care for people in church? It's like Jesus is saying, I'm looking at people now from all the nations, people who are allegedly members of church. They look like they're all on the same page, all part of the same flock. But here's what marks out the sheep from the goats, how they invested in people. And there's this lovely little turn of phrase in verse 34 he has when he speaks to the sheep and he says, come, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And it's like he's saying, this is what the divine family, my father and I and the spirit, this is what we've always been about right from the beginning. From the creation of the world, we've always been about this. So he wants us, he says, come welcome into this kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. And when he says that, it's like he probably wants us to think about what happened at the beginning of the world. Adam and Eve, one flesh, looking after each other. And then the Lord says, Adam and Eve, let's have that extended across the whole earth. Let's have more people to be joined together, united, looking after each other. Be fruitful and multiply people. More people. Who can be brought into the divine family? And he wants us to think about that question perhaps asked at the beginning of creation, near the beginning of creation in those early chapters of Genesis. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to look after him? That's that question that Cain asked about his brother Abel. And the answer is, is, yes, Cain, you are actually supposed to look after him. You're not meant to despise him and bury him from the beginning of the world. It's always been about church family loving one another and caring for each other. And as they care for other people in the divine family, the strange and wonderful thing occurs. Jesus says, as you helped and cared for them, you helped me. You cared for me. You met me. And this is fascinating. As they help even the most needy and vulnerable people in church, they meet him. Who is he? If you notice, unlike the previous parable, where it was just a, it was a man, a master with servants, and he's going on a journey, and that's the image he sticks with. Here, in this parable, he's mixing picture language with just factual description. Because uh, he, he doesn't say, ah, there was a master who went on a long journey and then he returned and then he got, and he happened to be a shepherd. He says, no, there's the son of man who arrives in glory with his angels. He's uh, coming with his angels in heavenly glory, verse 31. Verse 32, he's a shepherd separating sheep from goats. Verse 34, he's a king and the son of the father. Verses 37 and 44, he's the Lord. So with all these different titles, these different concepts of him. He's not just stuck with one, he's got loads going on. He's rammed all these ones in. Why is he doing that? Why is he bundling up all these concepts that describe who he is? Could it be because, th it, because this is this last bit of his teaching? In this last bit of public teaching, when he's already been challenging people to face up to who he is, who do you say that I am? Who is this son of David? Who, who is this Messiah? Could it be that here he's just going for it? This is his last bit of public teaching and he's just going for it, knowing that it will cost him his life. He's like, you know who I am, right? You know who I am. This is who I am. And this is how you get to know me. Church. Church is me. This is who I am. If you want to connect to me, what you need to do is get really involved in church. Start really associating with people in church and as you do that, when you really look after the most needy people in church, you're connected to me. Then you meet me. That's who you really are meeting. And then to hear that, that's incredible. We're like, what? what? 
cut you mean you we meet you this one the son of man who's been in place since the creation of the world the son of man from daniel the king that isaiah met the shepherd of ezekiel the eternal son of the father who speaks in the psalms this lord god of israel we meet him when we invest in people in church yeah you meet him if you do that and he equates himself with people in church even the least and the lowest the most vulnerable he's like what is their life equivalent to what's their value for jesus their life has the same value as his own we he's like we're the same them and me we're the same my life is their life what you do to them you do to me what did jesus say you mistreat one of my family my church family it's better if you hadn't been born better to lose the whole world than lose your very self you're worth more than the whole world for jesus as he looks on people he's he says my I'm, i'll give up my life for you you're worth my life and in church we're not you're not just worth a bag of gold we're worth more than the world itself the universe in church that's what people are worth human beings are designed to share this life of god forever no human being was supposed to be separated off into the darkness of hell because if you notice in this parable that was prepared for the devil and his angels not for human beings because he loves human beings and he designed everyone to be part of this life that he has from endless ages that's the message of this chapter invest in human beings look after people in church for jesus even the very least because who would want to hear this one say to them depart from me get away from me i've nothing for you those are chilling words when spoken by this one when instead we can be people who are authentically church who love the shepherd who know his voice and who just instinctively look after other sheep that's what happens especially the most vulnerable and down church is like that person needs extra help and they gather around and give help and support and people say oh that's great what you've been doing for that person and often people are just like what i'm just doing it that's just part of church life that's what we're that's what jesus is like that's what we that's what we're into just drop everything for people in church and that's where jesus ends his last bit of public teaching in matthew that's what he leaves us with and then just after that, there's this story, which we didn't read, of the woman with the expensive ointment. And she invests it in a person. This is what he's been addressing. What are you going to invest in? And it turns out you invest in people. And here we have an example of someone with one kind of currency who then totally blows it on this other kind of currency. She invests it on the ultimate person the image of God himself. She blows everything she's got just to do this nice gesture for Jesus. And some who are gathered, who should know better, say, well, that's, that's a waste. What are you doing that for? Wasting this on that. And Judas especially sees this extreme example of all this trajectory of money teaching, and that's the final straw for him. He's like, no, I'm not in. If that's the case, if we're going to be wasting this on that, I'm out. And he betrays Jesus and he actually trades Jesus in. He trades in the right currency for this old money. He does a return cash in. The woman says, I'm giving up this for him. Judas says, no, nah, I'm cashing in him for this. And really... For the price of a slave. That's Jesus worth to Judas. What about you today? What about us? Are we one of the sheep or one of the goats? 
Are we someone who shares in the master's happiness? Or do we not really know him or treasure what he treasures? Are we with him this morning? Are we with this woman, Mary? Or are we with Judas? That's our choice. Are you going to waste everything you've got for Jesus? Waste it for Jesus and people. Or are you going to use people to get this temporary treasure? And that's what matters. Let's meet the Lord Jesus in church as we throw ourselves into treasuring people for him. Therefore, to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed all the praise, all the glory, all the honour, all the majesty, and all the power, now and forever. Amen.